one of us. Father, we come into this place tonight, and we just ask that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, through your word, Lord, that we pray that as we, uh, as we open our ears to hear your, your word, Father, as we open our eyes to read and understand, Lord, I pray that you would just speak right to each and every one of us, right where we're at, Lord, your word in season to our hearts, to our souls, that we might walk out of this place encouraged and prepared to do and to be what you've called us to be. Lord, we thank you for the subject of grace. Lord, we thank you that we get to study it, we get to live it, we get to learn about it. Lord, may we continually seek after and grow in your grace. And Lord, we give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. We all together said, amen. Amen. Uh, uh, We're doing something new uh, specifically with this subject. It's uh, often talked about subject, and a lot of times there's questions regarding the subject of grace. So for the past couple of weeks, Pastor Dan and the leadership team have gathered together and taken some questions from notes and from uh, responses from the messages, and they've been doing a little audio podcast on the web app. Uh, If you go to rockchurch.com forward slash app on your phone, you can download, or it'll give you the link to download the church app. I think you can also find it on the webpage, but they've been doing a audio audio podcast over the past couple of weeks, just about 15 minutes, something you can listen to on the way to work. Uh, just kind of a debrief or so to say, like maybe a, a, a little in-depth subject or talk about what we, what we talked about on the subject or what might be or just some questions that came from it. And so I want to encourage you to grab a hold of that. You can go to rockchurch.com and listen to that. If you have a question, you can, our, our web guys tells us that if you uh, ask on Facebook, that might be a good way to do it. So anyways, just wanted to make that aware so that you can kind of get a little bit more because I tell you what, we cannot get enough of the subject of grace. Amen. Would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans in the 12th chapter? Pastor Dan was there in Romans, the 13th chapter, but Romans in the 12th chapter, we're going to talk about grace. And as we've been discussing what grace is, we've talked about the sanctification of grace. We've talked about grace and, and, and God's empowerment to lead us or allow us to live what his uh, word demands of us. And so as we continue the subject of grace, uh, Peter, Peter refers to it as this multifaceted, like a diamond. There's many different ways in which we see grace. And that's why, if you wonder, why is it diamonds on the backdrop? It's not because it's California and diamonds. And, well, no, it's, grace is like multifaceted, which means no matter how you look at it, light shines and refracts in a different way. And there's so many different things and, and ideas and, and, and what, the, what the Word of God says about the subject of grace. And so as we do it each week, we've been talking about it. We've been getting in depth to a specific specific subject. And today I want to talk to you about the subject of grace when it comes to serving. Now serving is kind of awkward, if I can just be a little bit transparent with you. It's a little weird, right? I mean, you think about it, you, you don't know what to do. You don't know how far should you serve or how, how do you serve? What's the best way? I mean, if, if, you're, uh, if you're like me and you're naturally an introvert, introverts unite at home alone, praise God. And um, <laughs> It just can get a little awkward because you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, you've got somebody at your house or you're in a conversation or across the table with somebody and, and you know you should do something or you should say something or how far do you go, you don't want to spend too much money on somebody, you don't want to, you don't want to be looked at as, as a cheap person or a stingy person and it just can get a little bit awkward when it comes to the subject of serving somebody else and then to add on top of the, the awkwardness of, of wondering how far do I go to serve or what do I do to serve somebody else, then you add on top of that, the culture in which we have created for ourselves, in which we are creating a self-centered or a a self-focused culture, in which if you look at anywhere you go, you look at a look at a dinner table at a restaurant, you look at a bus stop, you look at anybody around a a line at an amusement park, and most every person around is doing what nowadays? They're looking down, right? We're we're looking at what interests us, what engages us, what makes me happy. And so in order to add a little bit of pressure on top of the idea of, of service to others or serving others, we live in a culture that's exemplifying the self-servicing life in the sense that now when we communicate, communication's not done face-to-face anymore. If you want to you wanna tell somebody what you really think about something, you know how to do that. The correct and the, the appropriate way in which you do that is to go on Facebook and let the whole world know what you think of that one person, right? And, and you don't even have to mention that person by name because you just hope that by sharing your, your feelings, right, like that one person will know and just automatically receive and have receptivity to know that you're talking about them. And, and so face-to-face communication is kind of becoming this thing uh, of the past in which we communicate through digital mediums and social media and text messages and phones. And, and, it's, and face-to-face communication is hard. So then you take the idea of serving and face-to-face serving. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nowadays, that's just like like weird. It's just like crazy. Like, how can I serve? I'll, uh, here's how I can serve. I can serve uh, uh, in church. I can serve by, by coming and letting the pastor do his thing. Like, I know somebody 
that, I, that probably needs to hear the word of God. So what do I do? I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. I will bring them to church to let my pastor tell them about the word of God. Because this whole face-to-face, -face, this whole idea of serving, this whole idea of reaching out, this whole idea of living life for somebody other than just myself, it's, it's a little bit countercultural in our society and in our day and age. And as we continue to increase, as the generations continue to progress, it gets worse and worse. And I know what the generations look at, because it's funny, because I've got myself to that position now where you look at the next generation, you think, man, you guys are just hopeless, right? And one generation continues to look at the previous generation or the, 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 the upcoming generation thinking like, it's just getting worse and worse. And the, the beautiful part about that is, is that the previous generation is the byproduct of the current generation's education system and mentality. So we can blame the millennials for this, but at the same time, you're like, what are you talking about? At the same time, we are the product of our culture. And ultimately, when it comes to service, as we look at where America is going, as we look at where the world is going, this is what I'm talking about, is that the idea of face-to-face -face human interaction and serving one another in love is growing increasingly, increasingly rare. And... It's, 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 it's something that's strange. It's something that's almost counterintuitive to have somebody do something nice for you and you kind of ask, what do you want in return? Like, what are you trying to accomplish by this? And so the idea of service can get a little bit awkward. But you see, service is God's plan for the church. And service, service to others, doing life, living life for the purpose of somebody else is God's ultimate purpose for your life. You see, in order for us to live our lives with the idea that our lives are all about achieving and attaining things for our own goodness and our own, our own desires and our own likes and our own uh, uh, whatever you might have it, is, is an ultimate waste of the gift of God that we have on earth called life. Why? Because nobody at the end of their life on their hospital bed says, can you bring my shoes to me? Can you bring, my, can you bring that, that special? I, I just want to have a couple of minutes with my car before I die. Right, because those are not the things that fulfill us in life. Why? Because those are not the things that we were created for, right? We were created for the service of other people. That's the ultimate fulfillment of God's life. And I think one of my heroes, and I believe he's probably one of your heroes too, Martin Luther. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. had to say. He said, the most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? I mean, here's a man that we look to as in a nation, when we look to people to look up to, and we look at leaders, and we look at who's the next great, and who's the, the best plan. I mean, here's a person that his life was dedicated to a cause, but his life was not dedicated to a cause to point out how bad everything else was, but to bring light to a dark world. And in this man's life, and in, 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 his, in his vision, he says the most persistent, the most, the most uh, pressing thing in life, the most, the most important question we ask ourselves is what are we doing for others? But then when we look at the, so, the society and the culture in which we live, it's a little awkward. But Paul the Apostle talks about something today that we want to talk about in the context of speaking about the subject of grace. And grace, as, as dad defined it, was God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on, on our behalf when we can't do it. Pastor Deborah's uh, definition is, is God's power, grace is God's power in me to do what his will or his truth demands of me. Grace, we can define it simply as God's favor for us, as God's uh, stepping in when we can't make it. In Romans, the 12th chapter, Paul the Apostle is speaking to the church in Rome, and he starts to talk about the subject of service. And I want to just point a couple of things out to you as we look at what the Bible, what God's Word says about you and I in the subject of grace. In Romans 12, chapter, verse number 3, he says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, that's an interesting subject. That's an interesting idea if you think about it. Paul is saying, listen, don't think highly of yourself. Don't think that you're all that in a bag of chips. Why? Because God has given to every person a measure. He has dealt. He has given to each person a measure of faith. You think of it like a measuring cup. And, and Jesus talks about the parable of talents. And we look around and we see sometimes there are people that are more talented than us. They're graced, so we might say, to do something greater or bigger in the kingdom or in the world than we are. But Paul says, listen, don't, don't focus so much on yourself. Because God has given each person a measure of faith. And look what he says, for we all have many members in one body, but all of the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ 
and individually members of one another. We're all connected together. There's a divine purpose, if you, if you will, for God's plan for the, for the church. Which means that every person who is in the church, and the church is not this building, every, not every person that's in this building. Every person who is in the body of Christ, every person who believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who has committed their life to becoming a disciple or a follower of Jesus, God has a divine plan, a divine purpose, and each person is interconnected with the next person so that we would all uniquely, but individually, but as a body together, serve the body or the world around us for the glory of God, that we would live a divine purpose in our lives. You see, the beautiful thing about that idea is it doesn't matter how you came about living on this earth. It doesn't matter if you're the byproduct of, of, of something that was intentional or unintentional. It doesn't matter if your parents loved you or didn't love you. You see, we might, we wonder and we question, what is my purpose? What is my reason? What is my existence or the cause of my existence on earth? And God has a unique and individual purpose for each and every person who's in the body of Christ. And Paul says every person, when they live into their purpose are fulfilling the ultimate reason of existence or living together in the body of Christ. We're all connected together. So we're being many are in one body, individually members of one another. Having then, listen to this, gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Look at this. Let us use them. If in prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, what God has dealt to us. If in ministry, let us use our ministering. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's uh, exhorting, then exhort or encourage. If it's leading, if God has made you an amazing leader, then lead with diligence. If it's showing mercy, then use that gift of mercy uh, with cheerfulness. And so what Paul is saying is that each and every person has been given a gift, so to say, by the grace of God. You think about what grace is. In the Greek, the word grace that we use for grace is charis, which means grace. The, the root word of here, when we look at gifts, is the same word charis, spiritual gifts. Grace is the response of God, is unmerited favor to us to do something for us in which we cannot do on our own. And so God has given to each person the purpose in the body of Christ to have a role. You see, Christianity, the belief in Jesus Christ, the discipleship in Jesus is not a spectator sport. Although, unfortunately, in this day and age, we've seemed to have, have kind of leaned towards that. And in the sense of, I'll go to church, I'll spectate the pastor, he'll tell me some things, I'll hear about what the church or what the, the, the staff members of the church are doing for the community. And, and, and that's great, and I'm so glad for that, and I'll go live my life. But you see, nowhere do we see in God's holy word, in the New Testament, that we see that Christianity, discipleship, or the belief in Jesus Christ is a spectator sport. Rather, what we see throughout the Word of God, especially from Paul the Apostle, is that each and every one of us in the body of Christ has been given a unique gift or graced with a gift to do something for the body of Christ. Every purpose or every person in this room, every person in the body of Christ has a specific grace upon them, gift upon them, to fulfill in the body of Christ to serve others. Every person has been given grace, has been given a gift to serve somebody else. You see, we came, even Jesus said, I have come to seek and to serve those who were lost. The very essence of who Jesus is was to serve, to model what you and I are to do with our life, and that is to serve somebody else. But it's awkward, it's a little weird, I don't know how to serve, I don't know what to do. And Paul says, listen, God has given to you a specific and a unique gift in the body of Christ. If you're good at it, or if, if this is your gifting, if this is your grace, whatever it might be, if it's prophesying, then use it in faith. If it's teaching, then teach in faith. If it's ministering, what is ministering? Ministering is not the guy up here uh, teaching the word of God. Ministering is loving on somebody. If it's loving on somebody and just sharing the love of Jesus, then, then use it. If, if it's leadership within business, then do that. If it's giving, if God has given you a grace to make money for the kingdom, then use that and do that with what God has done. Why? Because every person in the body of Christ has a specific purpose and a specific reason for their existence. And God has given you 
the grace to fulfill that specific purpose in life. That's something to be glad about. You see, Paul writes to the believers in Rome and he says, do what you do with the measure of faith and the gift of grace that is given to you. God has given you a divine gift, not to serve yourself, but to serve others. And we'll talk about why he gave that gift to you. But what's so, what's so interesting is I love what he says. It's so, it's so, you think about this for a moment. Paul says in, in, the, in, the, in the pretext of what he's talking about, he says, listen, don't get haughty about your grace. Don't get all, don't get all big headed about how good you are. Don't, don't, don't start believing your own propaganda uh, of how good you are. Don't think of yourself as, as better than everybody else. I am all that, uh, 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 and a bag of chips. Just don't do that. This is why, because you've been given grace and faith. Now think about this for a moment. Think about this for a moment. It's so easy for us to get wrapped up in the things that we are good at. But the question I ask is, are the things that we're good at the things that we're graced at? Are the things that we're good at the things that we're graced at? You see, think about it like this. Paul talks about faith, a measure of faith. Think about it like this. Uh, somebody who is good at baseball. Somebody who has a, now it's not possible, but somebody who has a thousand or a hundred percent batting average, right? Like they've, they've never, they, they're so good, they've never missed a hit ever in their life in baseball, right? The Cubs just won, praise Jesus. I became a Cubs fan right after Keith Hershey finished last week, and I was a Cubs fan for about an inning and a half in that suspense, and now I'm back to where I am. I could care less, but 100%, does it take faith for that person? To step out onto the, to the bat, to step out onto the home plate and say, man, I'm really going to step out in faith and hope that I hit it. No, it doesn't. Why? Because they're gifted at it already. Right. See, what does it take faith to do? It takes faith to do those things that we're not naturally good at. And so what happens is Paul's saying, don't, don't, get, don't believe your own propaganda. Don't get all wrapped up in yourself because you're good at something. Why? Don't think more uh, highly than you ought to think. Why? Because it's not always the case of what you're good at is what you're graced at. Don't let your gifting get in the way of your grace. Because Paul says we got to use our faith and rely in God's grace to do what we do, to operate in this measure of, of faith and in grace. And so often what happens is we, we start letting our talent say, well, you know what? This comes naturally to me. So I must be graced in this area. This comes, this comes easy to me. So I must be graced in this area. And so what we do is we start focusing on what we're good at. And we start missing out on what we're graced at. Let me give you a real world illustration. I, I, I don't count myself to be a good public speaker. In the sense of like captivating and engaging. Why? Because I look at your faces when I preach. But. One thing I, I, I feel like that did come naturally to me is, is, is public speaking is, is one of the top three fears that most people on earth have. I didn't have that fear. Now, I'm an introvert. It's weird. I can't describe it. I can't explain to you. I don't do well on like personal conversations. You and I, if I don't know you very well, I'm very awkward. I don't know how to start a conversation. I don't know what to say from you. I might look across the table at, at the Starbucks having coffee with you and just kind of stare at you because I got no clue how to start that conversation. You get me up in front of a bunch of people and I've never, ever in my life had the problem of preaching short. I have too much to say. And in college, when I was in university, uh, and, and, and people would have to give presentations in, in these big classes of hundreds of students, I would just do this and say, here's the deal. I don't want to do any work. You don't want to do any public speaking. You do all the work. I'll do all the speaking. It's a partnership made in heaven. And I made my way through university doing just that. But I know that even though I might be good towards something, it's not necessarily what God wants to grace me at. Why? Because my weaknesses. You see, the desire of my heart is not to just come up here 
and to pontificate what we should all do, but to live the life that Jesus called each and every one of us to live and to engage with somebody and serve them on a personal level. So I'm not naturally apt to do that. So I don't necessarily need the faith to get in front of somebody and start opening my mouth. It's really easy and it's really easy to put my foot in it afterwards. But what I do need is I do need God's grace and I do need to step out in faith to initiate conversations with somebody when it's uncomfortable, when it's awkward, when it's weird, when all of a sudden I, I feel the impression of the Holy Spirit upon me say, you need to share Jesus with that person. What if they're going to think I'm weird? You're a pastor. I still feel that way. I'll, sh I'll share with them when I preach. You see, don't let your gifting get in the way of your grace. Because Paul says that you are graced by God. Your talent is not your human talent. Your talent is your grace talent. You see, Paul talked about it. He said, look, I'd rather boast in my infirmities rather than my giftings. And look at this. You, want to, you really want to see Paul talk about this? This is a massive subject. I, I, I want to just take you there for a moment. If you've got your Bible, just, just turn a couple pages from Romans to, to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. You want to talk about a guy who struggles and who needs some grace. Let's read what Paul the Apostle has to say. If you've got your Bibles, go with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 10, especially in that first couple of verses talking about spiritual warfare. But Paul in 2 Corinthians, in, this, in the 10th chapter, he talks about, look, what are you guys doing? Why are you looking at the outward appearance of everybody? Why are you looking at somebody's giftings, somebody's talents, and determining whether or not that means that they must be graced? Well, they're good at something. They must be graced for that. Look what Paul says about his own self. Look what Paul says in verse number 10. Paul says this. He's talking, about, he's talking to the church, and he says, for his letters, talking about himself. Y'all are saying this about me. For his letters, they say. Don't you hate when somebody says they said? Well, they're saying, who's they? Who's they? His letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. One translation says it's, it, it, it's, it, it's forgettable. So they say about me, Paul's saying, you are saying about me that when I write, I'm a heavy hitter. But then when I show up to your church and you're ready to give that love offering, what's a love offering? Love offering is when you give the speaker something. He's like, when you're ready to give that, you say, man, that, you, 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 <laughs> public speaking, Paul, is not your forte. Okay, you kind of stand up there, you're a little bit weak. Uh, uh, the writings about Paul, historians say that Paul was, uh, was typically a short guy, bow-legged, unibrow. Uh, that's just one of, the, one of the writings that we hear about that. So they say, Paul, in person, you're not all that impressive, but your, 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 your writings are, are, are heavy, they're weighty, but when it comes time to show up, you just kind of don't show up. So Paul, Paul's talking to the church, he's like, you know, here's the deal, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to tell you exactly in person what I told you in my letters talking about weighty and heavy, but I love what he says in a couple of verses down from that, verse number 13. Paul says, we, however, listen, he says, I'm not going to boast while how everybody else boasts. You think, you, I, if I could boast because I'm a good speaker, then I'll boast. But he says, I'm not going to boast how everybody else boasts. Why? He says, but within the limits of the sphere in which God has appointed us, a sphere which includes you. In, uh, Paul says, listen, if you want me to boast, where I will boast is the limits of the sphere that God has given to me. You see, Paul says, I'm not going to boast in my public speaking ability. I'm not going to boast in my tent making ability. I'm not going to boast in all these different things in my life. Paul says, if I'm going to boast, where I'm going to boast in my life is the limits of the sphere, the area. How about this? The grace or the gifting that God has given to me. I don't care what's going on over here. I don't care if you don't think I'm a good speaker or not. The area in which God has called to me is the area in which I will stay in. What happens is we look at talents and not grace. 
And we start looking at somebody else and say, well, I want to serve, but I want to serve like him. I want to preach like Pastor Dan preaches. I want to, I want to communicate like Pastor Jim. I, I, I want to get down. Listen, I'll just tell you like this. I want to get down like Bishop T.D. Jakes. And I said, go. Right. We look at people's talents. We look at people's natural affinity to do something. And we say, man, if I could just serve like that, if I could just prophesy like that, if I could just exhort, like, if I could just be a leader like them. And Paul says, stop looking at somebody else's circle of influence, sphere of, of giftings. Stop looking at somebody else's grace or talent and wanting your grace to be like their giftings. He says, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the grace that God has given to me. Why? Because my talent is nothing. He says, I'll count it all, all of it. My, my resume that was as good as it could get as a Jew. He says, I will count it all as dung, as poo. The, the, eh. Anyway, don't even go any further. I'm about to say something else. But he says, I would rather boast. Not in my talents. Not in what everybody else says is the gifting. I will boast in where God assigned me in his position. Why? Because when I'm living in the position of God, I'm living in the purpose of his kingdom. I didn't even write that down. You need to write that down. When I'm living in the position of God, you're living in the purpose of his kingdom. Dang, that was good. So you've got to embrace the grace to do what God has planned for you. See, Paul the Apostle, I love it. I love what Paul says in the previous book, in 1 Corinthians. Paul talks about his past. as man, I was a persecutor. I was a zealot. I was crazy. I was putting people in jail. I was separating families. I got a lot of weight on my shoulders. But in 1 Corinthians, in the 15th chapter, Paul says it like this. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, now that's not an excuse to be like, well, look, at I am what I am by the grace of God. We like to flip that around, man. You're, you're just, you, you just need to work on some. I am what I am by the grace of God. Well, you, you got a bad attitude. Well, I am what I am by the grace of God. No, 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 no. He's, he's using it in the other context. He's saying, I, I should be nothing. I'm worthless. I'm the least of all of these great apostles. I'm the little guy, literally the little guy. And he says, but who I am and what God has done for me and through me and by me, I am what I am by the grace of God, not the talent of my own ability, but by the grace of God. You see, God has graced you for a specific purpose in his kingdom to serve people. People. What does that mean? It may not mean what you're talented at, but it's what you're graced at. What has he put upon your heart to do? Because it's going to take faith to walk in grace to do what God has called you to do. Embrace the grace of God's purpose in your life. Praise Jesus. So how do I walk in my purpose? How do I know what that is? I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know what my purpose in life is. I've been coming to church forever and a day trying to figure that out, but I still don't know. You got to grow in grace. The Bible tells us, Peter says, you can grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Did you know you can grow in it and keep getting it? Grow in grace. How? Through faith, through humility, and through prayer. See, God wants you to step out in faith. He's saying, quit waiting for the opportunity. Start making one. Start doing something. Step out. Start doing something with your life. The Bible says in James and in Peter, 1 Peter, that God gives what? Grace to the humble. You want to grow in grace? You want to figure out the purpose of your life? Step out in faith. Grow in grace in your faith and your humility. And listen, uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. Constant communication with God is what it's going to take to operate and live and exist in the grace that God has given and gifted you to do to fulfill the purpose and the plan of his kingdom. You see, we just got to get out there and start doing something. My mom, I love it. Pastor Deborah, does anybody appreciate Pastor Deborah? Did did y'all know? Did y'all know that Monday was her birthday? She is hiding under the radar, but you know what? She's going to be here this weekend. I'm just saying. 
she's going to be preaching this weekend. My mama, my mama always said, like Forrest Gump, my mama always told me, <laughs> ministry is what your hand finds to do that's right in front of you. Ministry is what your hand finds to do that's right in front of you. But Pastor, look, I'm just trying to figure out what my grace is. What's right in front of you? Take your hands out your pockets and start doing something with your life. Start doing something. Step out in faith. Humble yourselves before the, the mighty hand of God that he would exalt you in due time and stay in constant communication, prayer with God. I love this. I love this. Uh, there's a story in the book of Acts. There's this young guy. His name's Philip. Philip was, uh, Philip was an evangelist. Philip, Philip was a preacher. Philip, Philip had a mir miraculous experience, an angel says to Philip, I want you to go down to this place. I want you to go to the south of Israel. Or I want you to just hang out down there for a minute. All of a sudden, Philip's down there in the south of Israel, hanging out. He sees an Ethiopian treasury clerk. This guy's dressed to the hilt. He's looking good. He's got the outfit on. He's on a chariot, which means this guy, he's got it all together, right? And the angel of the Lord says, I want you to go overtake that chariot. So Philip starts running at the chariot, knocks on the window. Hey, man, what's going on? He hears this guy, this Ethiopian guy, reading the book of Isaiah. Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? Isn't it funny that 2,000 years ago they were asking the same question? <laughs> Come on, you know you've been asked that question before. Like, hey, man, what are you reading in the Bible? Oh, dude, I was reading uh, Leviticus. Do you understand what you're reading? <sighs> yeah. I am what I am by the grace of God. Acts in the 8th chapter, the Ethiopian responds, and he says, how can I unless someone guides me? How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. Look at that. He asked Philip to come and sit with him. You see, you want to start stepping out in your opportunities of grace? Step out in faith with humility and in prayer. And the, present, the, the opportunities will present themselves. You know, one of the things I said I needed grace in, Stacey and I, we needed grace in, was personal conversation with people. I don't want to just be up here and, and telling people from a stage about Jesus. I want to tell people with my life. So we started praying, God, we want some opportunities. Guess what? Somebody close to us in proximity just started asking some questions. Hey, I, I went, my, my son had this religious studies class and I read about the day of Pentecost and I don't, I don't know what that's all about. And it's like, well, let me explain it to you. And all of a sudden, the door starts opening. And now it's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel natural. It's kind of weird. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. What if they ask a question that I don't know the answer to? And all of a sudden, what am I doing? I am stepping out in my faith and in humility, understanding that it's not about me. Now I'm walking in God's grace to serve somebody else. God's grace to serve somebody else. The opportunities will present themselves. Once again, talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. Why did I like Dr. Martin Luther? Why am I quoting him tonight? I don't know. I just found some quotes. And I'm like, man, that's perfect. He said this. He said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need to have a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. That's a Christian message. Anybody can serve. You just need to have a heart, 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 heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And you can do anything for the kingdom of God in God's grace, his specific gifting for you. You see, the reality of what it all comes down to is that America is coming into a new season. As we've seen that last night, seen that today. America is entering into what most of the world or great many parts of the world are already in. And that's called a post-Christian world. In the sense of Christianity is to the mindset of the people. I've been there. I've done that. They've heard about Jesus. They know about Jesus. They've been to church as a kid or their parents went to church. They are affiliated or were at one point in their life affiliated. As a matter of fact, the Barna Group said last year that 46% of Americans identify now as post-Christian. Which means I got a camp t-shirt in my closet to prove that I used to go to church. But I'm not there anymore. A post-Christian nation. Which means that people are less apt, and you know this, they are less apt to hear you preaching at them about the gospel. They're less apt to receive you telling them about their sin and about their wrongdoing. They're less apt to the response of receiving a tract from you as you go door to door. Why? Because we are entering a new era in America and many parts of Europe and, in, 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 in the, and the other parts of the world are already here. And so the question is, is what does this have to do with my serving grace? It has everything to do with my serving grace. And let me share, you, share with you why. When we went to Israel a couple of weeks ago, I found it so amazing and so insightful 
to see where Israel is. You see, Israel by far is a post-Christian nation. As a matter of fact, there are rules, laws, legislations against proselytizing or preaching Christianity in Israel. What do you mean America's supposed to support Israel? They don't want, they don't like the idea of somebody from the West flying all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and trying to convert them, convert them to something else. And so they have laws, they have rules, they have regulations. You can't, we, Brad and I were sitting there in, in, in the Western Wall and it was kind of like, hey man, I just feel like like jumping up like Peter and just having that Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2 kind of, you know, like, hey, I'm going to preach Jesus whom y'all crucified. They don't do that anymore. You can't do that anymore. It's illegal. And besides that, think about it like this. It's a people group who have heard about Jesus for 2,000 years, yet still have not accepted Jesus. And so all of this Western influence comes in. And it just kind of, they throw it against the wall and it's not sticking. And we started, we met almost every night with, with Messianic pastors and, and believers, Messianic believers of 11 million people in Jerusalem. There are only 15,000 Messianic Jews in Israel. It's a very small group and they all know each other. And as we were talking, it's like one person after the next person after the next person was telling their story about how they found Jesus. And it's like, oh my gosh, are we saved in America? Like the, 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 the angel of the Lord led you down the freeway and you got a flat tire and that person came over and they started talking to you about Jesus. And they said, you said, show me where Yeshua Mashiach is in my Bible. And you open up the Bible and it's like right there. And you're like, I believe it. It's like that doesn't happen out here, man. And you see, it's a different way of evangelism. As a matter of fact, we talked to one pastor, his mission, his, his, his whole ministry was ministering to Holocaust survivors. And he started talking about this. He said, you know, at first we started preaching Jesus. At first we started telling them about Yeshua. We started telling them about the message of the cross and, and salvation of their sins. And he asked one lady about, where's your God or do you believe in God? And she said to him, and her response was, my God died in Auschwitz. He was a ministry to Holocaust survivors. And he said at that moment, he realized that he could no longer just preach Jesus. Why? Because she shared her experience in the concentration, concentration camps at Auschwitz. And she saw every day the Nazi soldiers who imprisoned her had crosses around their necks and crosses on their belts. And she said, anything that digni or, or, or that, that, that is associated with that, why would I want anything to do with that? And he realized at that moment, I, it's not about how I preach to her anymore, but now it's about how I serve her. And my service to this 90-year-old Holocaust survivor, the fact that I love her when nobody else around her wants to love her, the fact that I, I'm not coming with an agenda that she sees, that she just sees that I'm a genuine person stepping out to do something for her benefit, now all of a sudden opens the door to hear about Yeshua, Mashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. And that is how every day people in Israel are coming to find Jesus. It's not by the thousands, it's by the singular. But as America walks into this new culture, this new era of of the post-Christian nation, people are less apt to find themselves wandering into the church, which means the season of let me bring somebody to the church so the pastor can do the service to them means now the season is we, the church, must go to the people to serve them. Each and every person within the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, has a unique and a specific gift and calling to bring a light to this world in the name of Jesus through the service of others. Jesus, out of his own words in Matthew, the fifth chapter, says, when you do good things, serve people that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, as this nation, as this world moves beyond a message uh, or beyond the receptivity of somebody preaching at them, now it must go into a season in which people serve each other without an agenda, without a purpose, other than just to share the love of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world so that the words of Jesus Christ might be fulfilled, that when they look at you and when they look at me, and it might be awkward, it might be weird, it might be uncomfortable, and it's not in my natural talent, but it is in my grace that I serve. Now all of a sudden they look at you, they look at me, they look at the church, and they see the Father in heaven. You see, the grace of God to serve others is not for your glory. It's for God's glory. Yeah, that's good. And that's why Paul says, don't get a big head about it. 
Just because you're helping people, just because you're loving people, just because you're doing good doesn't make you better than anybody else. Why? Because it's not about your glory. It's about God's glory. And while it might be awkward, while it might feel weird, while it might be uncomfortable to step out of my comfort zone, if I can learn to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ by stepping out in faith, the measure of faith that God has given to me, if I would just humble myself and realize that it's not about my talents, it's about my grace. And if I would stay and remain in prayer, constant communication with God, I believe that God wants to awaken the church in America to do something great beyond a political greatness, beyond a social greatness. God wants to awaken the church in America to do something on a global scale, to share the love of Jesus with people that are lost and dying and going to hell every day, that we might serve them, that we might love people, People, that we might reflect the goodness and the message of God, a message not of condemnation, but a message of grace. Why? Because we are walking and serving in grace every day. Church, let's get out today. Let's do something with our lives in the service of somebody else, not for our own glory, but for the glory of God, of Jesus Christ, who lives on the inside of us, who has given us a measure of faith and the gift of grace to do something great for his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we pray as we walk out of this place, Lord, that you would just, through your Holy Spirit, impart, impart to us your desire, your plan, your purpose for us, Lord. As the psalmist said, Lord, teach me to walk in your will. Not to understand it, not to know it, not to comprehend it. Teach me to walk in your will, Lord. As we look and Ask for opportunities, Lord. That may we recognize that ministry is simply taking what is, our, is in front of us and putting our hand to it, Lord. I thank you that we would step out in faith, remain humble, and continually live in prayer as we seek after you, Lord. And we live in our grace and not our giftings. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Before we leave tonight, I want to just take a quick moment. Just ask you to just... Remain seated. I'll let you out in just a couple of minutes, I promise. But I just want to take a moment and talk to you about the condition of your soul. You see, the Bible says that eternity has been set upon the hearts of men. And we all think about this. There's, there's something greater to life. You know, most of the world, I think it's 99% or 99.8% 99 of the world believes in some form of higher power, higher, higher purpose, or some form of, of afterlife of something. See, it's been said on the hearts of men, and I ask this question, what happens to you when you die? See, Paul talks about, the very man we were reading from today, Paul talks about that, to be, uh, that, that, that we ought to examine ourselves from time to time, that we ought to look into our soul and look into our life and take a reflective look at where we are. And I want you just to take a quick moment and reflect on your life. And where would you be if you were to die tonight? Would you find yourself in heaven? Would you find yourself in hell? Would you find yourself in the right position with God or would you find yourself in opposition with God? You see, how you arrive at that conclusion, how you answer that conclusion in your heart, because nobody's going to know the answer except you and God, not the person sitting next to you, not the person that brought you, not the person that's been next to you all of your life, only you and God. And how you come to that conclusion in your heart has a lot to say about your position and your place with God. And so often we think that because we're positive, because we think everything's good, because we hope everything's good, because we wish that things would go good. Man, I really want to go to heaven when I die. So often we think, well, because I go to church on a regular basis, because I'm a religious person and I've got a cross around my neck, or I was raised as a Lutheran or a Baptist or a Catholic, I was christened or baptized as a child. So often we think that if I volunteer in a church service or I give as the bucket drops by, that God sees that and everything's good between me and God. I even heard one person say it like this. If, as, so often we think that if we're good people, that good people go to heaven. And one person said it like this, Pastor, I just figured, or I just figured if, it's, if I be good and I do good, it's all good. And man, that's great. That, that would be so wonderful if that's really what it is. But you see, from the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, it tells us a different story. It's not about our hopeful thinking. It's not about our insights or our wishes or our wants. It's not about our, our location of, our, of where we sit on a Wednesday or a Sunday morning. See, it's not about our religious service or, or, or a cross around our neck. It's not about our good deeds. 
The fact that you haven't cheated on your taxes or robbed the 7-Eleven doesn't make you or qualify you as good enough to get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because the Bible tells us, Paul the Apostle says that we have all, every, every one of us, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You think about it for a moment. Well, I don't feel like I'm a bad person. Sin's kind of a big word. Growing up as a, as a kid, nobody had to teach you how to lie when your mama asked you a question that you didn't want to answer. Nobody had to teach you how to steal a cookie from the cookie jar. Nobody had to teach you how to, how to, how to, how to cheat on a quiz that you didn't know the answer to. You kind of just came by that on your own. Why? Because there's an inherent sin nature on the inside of every human being born into that separates us from God. No matter what we do, there's nothing we could do to make ourselves good enough in the eyes of God. But you see, the Bible says in that same verse that the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. The gift of God. Despite the fact that we didn't deserve it, despite the fact that we can't earn it, despite the fact that we can't buy it or work for it, God gave us a gift of salvation, and that gift is His Son, Jesus Christ. See, Jesus came. So the Bible tells us He came and He lived and He died on a cross, innocent of sin. And He took sin upon Himself. He took your sin and He took my sin upon Himself that we might be whole and reconnected to God as we accept and believe in Jesus' our leader, as the savior of our lives, our chosen and anointed one. See, Jesus says it like this to a man in, in the book of John in the third chapter. He says that unless you're born again, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Inheritance is for somebody, a child who's on the inside. But the Bible is very clear that our sin nature makes us outsiders looking in. But you see, through the sacrifice of Jesus, through what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, he says, now through belief in me, I take you from the outside and I bring you to the inside. But that doesn't come because of hopeful thinking or wishful insight. It doesn't come from a real sense of religion or a, a title of Christian or Baptist or Lutheran or Catholic. It doesn't come from the fact that your parents christened you as a child or you were confirmed. It doesn't come because you're a good person. It comes solely from the belief in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. A wholehearted acceptance of Jesus. It's not about a head knowledge or a carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. I know who the, the current president of the United States is. I know who the next president of the United States is. I know where he's going to live. I know the wife. I know the name of his wife. That doesn't mean I know him personally. You can know all about something and miss it completely on the personal level. And God says, I don't want you to know about Jesus and miss him personally. As a matter of fact, Jesus says it like this in the book of Revelation. Speaking to churches, people like you and I. He says, listen, I'm going to return. I'm going to come back. And he says, I know what you're doing. I know your works. I know your life. He says, when I come back, I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, because if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. It's a shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. And see, what Jesus is saying is that, listen, I'd rather find that you're standing for something. Because if you're somewhere in the middle doing your own thing, doing a little bit of my thing, not wholehearted against me, not wholehearted for me, occasional church attendance, token prayer, kind of right in the middle. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're kind of nothing. He says, I'm going to reject you from the kingdom of God. And the same rebuke he gives to the church, he says these words. He says, but behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And he says, if you just open the door of your heart, if you just open the door, he says, I will come into your heart. I'll come into your life and I will dine with you. We'll be in communion and relationship together. See, I believe right now that the Spirit of God is knocking on the door of your heart, saying, would you open your heart to me today? Would you respond to life to me today? If you're to take an open and honest look in your life. You know the condition of your soul better than anybody else except God. Maybe in this place there's a void, there's an emptiness on the inside of you that you've tried to fill with friends, you've tried to fill with position, you've tried to fill with titles, you've tried to fill with things, but no matter how much you try to fill your life up with stuff, you can't seem to fill that thirst. Why? Because there's a hole on the inside of you, a gap designed to be filled by Jesus. And today, the Spirit of God's knocking on your heart saying, would you, would you respond to the invitation to receive me into your heart and your life and to have eternal life with me in heaven and have an abundant life in your soul here on earth? See, Jesus says, I came that you would have life and that you would have it abundantly. The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not gonna force his way or make his way. And it's your choice today. And I wanna give you just a moment and in just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to receive that gift, to accept that invitation in your heart. And here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation with you today. And if that's you in this place today, and you're saying, man, you know, I think that's me, and I want to, I want to pray that prayer of salvation. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You see, what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what, I, I want to give my heart, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I, I, want, to, I want to do what you're, what you're talking about today. I feel like you're talking to me about that. I feel like there's just something going on in the inside of me that I need to respond. If that's you today, in a moment, you pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, you can put it right back down, and we'll pray that prayer together. Who should raise their hands? If you're not 
giving your heart, you're not giving your life to Jesus. If that's you in just a moment, get ready. If you're not sure, don't walk out of this place without being sure. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit on the inside of you that comes upon your relationship with Jesus is His seal of approval for you. You do not need to walk out of this place wondering or hoping that you might make it with God. He says, you should know without a shadow of a doubt because I'm living on the inside of you. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, listen, if you've been playing games, doing the church thing on Sunday, Wednesday, coming and doing your own thing the rest of the week, listen, come on. It's time for you to get serious with God today. The decision is yours. The decision is now. You've had doctors and dentist appointments. Today, it's a divine appointment between you and God. Will you respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ all across this auditorium, wherever you're at, if that's you, you pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down. Right after that, I'll call you up, and we're gonna pray together a prayer of salvation. If that's you in this place today, you say, that's me, I wanna, I wanna raise my hand so I can see it, I acknowledge it, and we'll go forward from there. All across this auditorium, from the front to the back, side to side, if you're at home watching on the live stream, you can pray the prayer as soon as we pray it together. Wherever you're at, this is your moment, this is your time. I'm gonna count to three, and if that's you, you pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down. You ready? Here we go today. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. If that's you, I see you right there, sister. I see you right over there. That's you in this place today. Anybody else in this place today? A couple of people. Spirit of God's moving on your heart. Say, man, I wonder if I should. Yep, you should. That's you today. About two wise people. I feel like there's more, but see Danny's pointing over here. Where are you? I see him right there, my man. I see you. Anybody else in this place today? Listen, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. This is your moment. This is your time. Here's what we're going to do. If you want to pray that prayer, if you want to give your heart, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want things to change in your life, today is the day of your salvation. Here's what we're going to do. You raise your hand now. Let's pray that prayer together. And I want to pray that prayer with you today. I want to look you in the eyes. I want to shake your hand. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand. My, friend, my friend's going to sing a song. And as we do, I was like, I thought you were Jared. <laughs> Just listen. I was about to call you Jared. Tiva, I see Tiva coming. Tiva's gonna sing a song. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come meet me right here. Let me shake your hand and let's pray together right here, right now. Let's change destinies together. That's you in this place. Come on and come meet, meet me up here right now. Let's change destinies together. That's you, you come. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should come, come on. This is your moment to respond to the invitation of God in your life today. If that's you, come on, you come. If that's you, you come. This is your moment. Why? Well, praise God, you guys came. Now, you're with him or are you guys both coming? And both? You. Cool. Hey, I want to tell you something. Jesus tells this really cool story about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. And he says, if a shepherd has 100 good sheep, and he says, if he loses one sheep, what's he going to do? He says he's going to leave the 99 good sheep, and he's going to go out into the woods, and he's going to look for that one sheep. And he says, what is he going to do when he finds that sheep? He says, he's going to throw that sheep over his shoulders, and he's going to come back, and he's going to tell everybody about it. Hey, look what was lost, and now is found. Come celebrate. And he goes on, and he describes. That's what God does for you. That's what God does for you. That's what heaven does for you when you make that decision to follow Jesus. Heaven is having a party for you right now. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Good job. Good job. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer together, okay? God doesn't listen to the words of your mouth like an abracadabra magical formula. He listens to the prayers of your heart. So I'm just going to say a couple of words. You just repeat them after me. You believe them with your heart. You confess them. Same with, the, with your mouth. And the Bible says you shall be saved, all right? So you believe these things. We're going to confess it. So let's all pray together. If that's you in this place, you pray with me. But let's all pray together. Would you all bow your, and let's, bow your heads and let's go before the Lord. Repeat these words after me. Father God, I need you today. I leave my past behind. I dedicate my future to you. Lord, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my past. And lead me in my future. Today, I make the decision to follow Jesus Christ with all of my heart and with all of my life. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he came, that he died on a cross, and that he rose again. And today, I commit to following him for the rest of my days. Fill me tonight with your peace, with your comfort, with your purpose, and with your Holy Spirit. I'm a Christian, headed for heaven, leaving hell behind. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, brother, give me a key. Congratulations.
Hey, the guys, really quickly, see this guy right over here? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's going to take you guys just right over there. He's going to pray with you. You need some prayer. He's going to give you some free information. He's going to invite you to come back and hang out with us really quickly. So if you guys just go right over there, let's give the Lord a great big praise. That's a lousy praise. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Yeah.